We continue our discussion on the electric power T and D networks. After establishing key reasons for interconnection, let us look at a couple of important features for these interconnections. Still, the main reference is on chapter six of Von Meyer. We start with the three phase system. We earlier mentioned that a single line in the system diagram corresponds to three wires in the actual system. So let us look at this three phase system. If we go inside a large power plant, we will see a number of large generating machines. This picture shows about six large generating units. When optimizing the design of these generating units, it turned out that a better design was developed when there are three sets of windings or wires inside every generating unit to produce sinusoidal voltage. Three voltage are simultaneously generated while the turbine spins. We say that with a three-phase system, we have generators that produce three-phase voltages. And we also have advantage for having less wires for the interconnection. We can imagine that each generating unit produces a separate voltage. So we have three separate voltages produced at the same time. These voltages can produce to three separate loads, also at the same time. We can imagine the setup to be similar to this as three separate sources and three separate loads. But the more realistic setup for this is the one shown on the right. We emphasize that this one unit here producing three separate voltages there that can be delivered through three separate wires to three separate loads. We can clearly see that the power here and the current through phase A can be delivered to the load here, and then power goes back through the neutral wire back to the generator. For phase B, it will be through this wire here, through the second load, and back through the same neutral conductor. You can say for phase C as well, back through the same neutral conductor here. So what we can easily observe is from six wires here, we only have four wires here. So we have practically saved two wires for the setup. But there is more. The AC voltages that are produced are three sinusoids, which looks which look like this. With this shape of the three voltages, we have black here for phase A, dark gray for phase B, and light gray for phase C. We show here the currents IA, IB, and I see flowing through IA, wire B, and wire C here. Based on the figure here, at any point in time, you can compute for the sum of the currents. So at this point in time here, that's IA here, that's IB there, and that's IC there. Notice that this is half of this one here and negative at that. So the sum of this and this and that is equal to zero. Whatever time point, time point in time that you pick there, this one or this one or this one, the sum of all three would always be zero. So what does that imply? The current flowing through the neutral wire here is the sum of IA plus IB plus IC going through here, and that is equal to zero. 
So the current through the neutral wire is zero. In fact, we can remove this neutral wire because no current is flowing through it anyway. So from six wires here to four wires here, it can even be down to three wires. So in delivering power from a three-phase generator here, to set the three loads there, we can really minimize the number of wires. And wires are expensive and wires are heavy. More wires require bigger and stronger tower to produce clearance and to carry the weight. So we say that the three-phase system allows us less wires. So to simplify the diagram, we draw a single line for every three-phase wire. So we call it a single line diagram. When we get to your circuit analysis course, there are techniques to analyze this as a single phase equivalent circuit, which is not too difficult at all. The next issue here is whether to use high voltage or low voltage. Why do we even have high voltages, even extra high voltages or ultra high voltages? Large generators produce voltage as, at less than 50 kilovolts. We utilize at 220 volts. In the Philippines, we have 500 kilovolts and 200 kilovolts. But why do we do that? Recall that power is the product between the voltages and the current. And in transporting large amount of power, we increase the voltage, so we reduce the current. What's the benefit in reducing current? First, power losses is proportional to the square of the current. So if we reduce the current, we actually reduce power losses quite significantly. It's not proportion, it's, it's actually proportional to the square of the current. We also recognize that the voltage drop across the line is proportional to the current. So if we reduce the current, we reduce the voltage drop. Of course, the question here is, so can we increase the voltage to much higher levels? We have in the Philippines 500 kilovolts. But in China, we heard that they have 1,000 kilovolts transmission lines. Can we not do that here in the Philippines as well? At higher voltages, more insulation is required. For example, the polymer insulation in transmission lines need to be much thicker. Again, thicker insulation means heavier lines and much stronger towers. So depending on the amount of large power we want to transmit, we decide on the optimal voltage levels to use using standardized values. Another illustration include for voltage breakdown is what we have in lightning and what we have in your capacitors that's rated 25 volts. If you use those capacitors beyond 25 volts, those capacitors will pop and burn. Of course, the key to all this are transformers. We are able to scale voltages up and down as we need using transformers. So here are figures of transformers. On the left is a distribution transformer we commonly use and you commonly see mounted on street poles. And the middle is a power transformer that we have in substations. On the right is a simplified diagram on what's inside the transformer. Basic components include winding one here, winding two here, and the common core for the common magnetic field. To achieve voltage transformation, winding one and winding two should have different number of turns. So that's the symbol there for the transformer with important parameters N1 and N2. Because the magnetic flux is coupled between the two windings, voltage is induced due to changes 
in the common magnetic field. The ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the number of turns. This also a direct application of Faraday's law, which we learned previously. If we assume a ideal transformer, there is no losses across the transformer. And power in the primary winding is equal to the power on the secondary winding. We can rearrange terms here, and we get the ratio for the current compared to the ratio for the voltages. And so we say that the turns ratio here could be related to the turns to the, to the ratio of the current. But take note that this is the opposite of this one here. If you are familiar with the war of the currents, which has been developed as a commercial movie, the current war, there is this long standing debate on AC versus DC. For a long time and up to the present, AC transmission has proven itself as the better technology, mainly because AC voltage can be transformed to higher or lower voltages using transformers. With that, Losses and voltage drops across the line have been minimized. Edison failed to do that for his DC system. However, with further development in electronics, especially in power electronics, DC transmission has found some key applications, especially in high power applications for a few hundreds to a few thousands of megawatts across long distances. In the Philippines, the link that connects Luzon to Visayas is an HVDC link, 350 kilovolts for 440 megawatts between Naga City and Ormoc Lake. Likewise, being built right now is the Visayas to Mindanao HVDC link, again 350 kilovolts for 450 megawatts between Cebu Island and Zamboanga del Norte. Instead of three conductors, we only need two conductors. Likewise, reactance is eliminated and some stability issues are eliminated as well. On the other end, low voltage DC are being used as well. By the way, towers for high voltage DC look like this. Notice that we don't have a set of three wires this time, but just a pair of wires here. The wires there, again, are pilot wires and communication wires. But going back here, low voltage DC networks are becoming more common because DC generation, such as solar PV and DC loads for electronic and keeping equipment are much more common these days. Another key feature for delivering power is the topology. Is it grid connected or radial configuration? The figure on the top is grid, while the figure on the bottom is radial. How do we differentiate? For a grid connection, the key characteristic is that there are multiple sources and multiple sinks or loads. We need multiple paths for power to flow from any source to any load. Can you verify that in this diagram here? Suppose we need power from generator at bus one to be delivered to a load connected to bus nine. We should be able to trace multiple paths from generation to load. So these are three paths that we can identify. So even if one path is not available, there are alternate paths for power to go. If multiple sources are indeed available and we need to deliver at higher reliability, even if more costly, then this configuration is preferred. The transmission network is designed this way. We have a Luzon grid, a Visayas grid, and a Mindanao grid. For example, if power is needed in Metro Manila, 
there are multiple sources and multiple paths for power to get to Metro Manila. On the other hand, we, if we have a single source and there is a single path for power to be delivered to a source, then we have a radial configuration as shown on the bottom here. The root is the only source. If we need to deliver power to a load at the bottom edge, there's only one path for power to flow. This is much simpler, cheaper, but less reliable. If the load is not very critical, suppose our house, we may not need multiple sources or multiple paths for power to flow. So this is typical for distribution systems. How about within the house? Can you figure out whether you have radial or grid connection available there? Here is another way for distribution networks. And this one is available in Europe and in even many parts of Singapore. Their distribution network is configured this way. Can you figure out if their distribution network is radial or grid configuration? The next feature is related to protection. And we have protection devices in our transmission and distribution networks. Although it's easier to explain this starting with our house wiring. Have you ever played with the electrical outlet, sticking a metal and caused a short circuit? Or sometimes a faulty appliance was plugged in, likewise causing a short circuit. If you did, I hope you were safe. When that happens, our house wiring should be equipped with protection devices such as miniature circuit breakers in a panel board or fuses in a fuse box. Can you check where the distribution panel or fuse box is located in your house? What these devices do is that they split your house circuit into a number of sub circuits one circuit breaker or one fuse for every sub-circuit. Can you count the number of sub-circuits in your house? By the way, the first protection device here or here is for the mother circuit, which is the entire house. So don't count that in. In the case where one sub-circuit is compromised, for example, a short circuit occurs in one outlet, then the entire sub-circuit may experience a large short circuit current, in which case the protection device at the root of that sub-circuit senses the large current and will trip the circuit. A circuit breaker trips open while a fuse blows with an abnormally large current. When that happens, you will notice that all outlets in that sub-circuit will not be available, while other outlets or loads such as lighting in other sub-circuits should continue to work. We say that we were able to localize the trouble. There was one student who shared to the class before that when he was a kid, he played with the outlet and caused a short circuit Power in the entire house went down, and power in the entire subdivision went down too. Oops, what can you say about the protection design there? That leads us to the next slide, where we show how power flows, flows in a distribution and how protection could be implemented. Power flows from the source from the upper left of the diagram, downstream to customers. The word downstream is quite convenient in describing power flows from the source to the loads. On the other hand, protection should be coordinated towards upstream. In the previous slide, we described protection within the house. The next level of protection should be available upstream and is most likely available at the distribution transformer. That's the symbol for the distribution transformer 
That's how it looks like in real life. Shown here is a fuse cut out at the transformer such that a short circuit in the transformer or in the circuits downstream should be sensed and tripped by this fuse cut out. Again, if the short circuit occurred inside the house, then a local protection device should be have tripped sooner. Proceeding upstream, there could be another protection device, another fuse cut out, that's a closer view of a cap out, or a recloser. Likewise, a circuit breaker is available at the substation. So to summarize on system protection, the key principle is that we should have protection devices in place and are properly coordinated so that when a short circuit occurs, then these devices should perform to minimize the effect of such short circuit. As much as possible, we keep the trowball local and the bigger system should be kept unaffected. It is much simpler to illustrate this in a distribution system in a radial configuration where power flows unidirectionally. This becomes more complicated in the transmission system where power flows may come from various directions. Another concern in delivering power is the reality of system losses. The utility tries to quantify losses and then to manage losses. Initially, losses will be reduced, but eventually it just have to be maintained at a very low but reasonable level. We differentiate between technical losses and non-technical losses. Technical losses are inherent in the delivery of power and is dictated by the physics of the devices. For example, when current flows through the wire, the resistance of the wire converts some power from electrical energy to heat energy. Unless we use superconductors, losses can be a few percent of a delivered power. Technical losses are also incurred in the transformers and in every equipment in the system. There are losses while the load is connected and the equipment is loaded. There could also be losses while the, track, while the equipment are not loaded. Have you experienced your charger getting hot when left unplugged? Even if it is not, when left plugged, even if it's not being used to charge your cell phone? That's a no-load loss in the transformer inside your charger. There are also non-technical losses, and these are due to human activities, whether deliberate or not. What do we mean by deliberate? Electricity theft via jumpers or meter tampering is being done by some. There could also be errors in billing, included in meter reading and in record keeping. Again, most of these are unintentional, but some could be intentional. Does this look familiar? Sometimes referred to as spaghetti wires. In one house committee meeting on system losses, we were berated by a congressman regarding this spaghetti wires. Our initial reply was that these wires shown here are not power lines. These are communication lines. The congressman would not understand the difference. I will refrain from saying unpleasant things to telecom companies here. This next figure admittedly are power lines. Also shown are elevated pole metering that are used to minimize non-technical losses. Can you figure out how it reduces technical losses as well? The boundary between customers and the utility is the meter. Upstream from the meter is the utilities side. Downstream from the meter is the customer side. If illegal connection happened upstream the meter, 
the utility bears the losses. But if illegal connection happened downstream the meter, the neighbor who owns the meter bears the losses. When the utility elevates the meter, it will be much harder to connect a jumper upstream the meter. How do we differentiate between the two? This one is on communication wires. This one is on power lines. Notice that these communication wires do not terminate on a meter. If these wires terminate on the meter, then that must be power lines. How about this one? Can you figure out if these are communication lines or electric power lines? I think these are electric power lines as they appear to be terminated at an elevated pole metering. To summarize the system losses, we recognize that engineers can contribute in minimizing or managing such losses. The last portion of our discussion is on power system operation. And this the material is mostly based on chapter nine, section 9.1 of our reference material. We talk about the general principle and scheduling and dispatch. We recognize that decisions in operating and controlling a complex electric power system may happen across various time scales. Understandably, some decision happening in shortest time scales of a few milliseconds is beyond human capabilities. Hence, automated functions should be in place to address those. And that includes the protection devices we talked about earlier. This happens much faster than people and human can decide on. Literally, there are organizations whose role is to operate the electric power system. In the Philippines, this is done by the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines with their office in Quezon City. They work 24 seven to make sure that we have power real time. The image shown is taken from the transmission development plan showing their operation system. For long-term planning, government organizations such as the Department of Energy and the Transmission Corporation of the Philippines are involved as well. Let us emphasize here the basic principle. The basic goal of operating a power network is that the power system should be able to have the supply meet the demand. Unlike other commodities such as food, which can store and can be stored in warehouses or in freezers, there is very little storage available in the power system. When we demand electricity upon flicking a switch, we expect electric power to be available right now. The key role in system operation is to make sure that there is supply to match the demand. There is generation to match utilization, effectively in real time. In terms of real power, every watt required by each appliance turned on plus power losses along the delivery or along the lines must be matched by the same watt from generators. When that happens, the system operates at exactly 60 Hertz. The generated voltage from spinning generator is an AC voltage at 60 Hertz. Each appliance will consume electricity at 60 Hertz as well. If in case there is more demand, than supply, spinning generators will slow down to produce voltages lower than 60 Hertz. On the other hand, if demand is less than supply, generators will spin faster to produce voltage higher than 60 Hertz. Depending on the sensitivity of the machine and the appliances, some gets destroyed when operating outside its design at 60 Hertz. So it is the operator's responsibility to keep the supply and demand matched 24 seven 
and operating the network at exactly 60 hertz. In the Philippines, the system operator in coordination with the market operator decides on which generation units to operate and at what power level in order to meet the demand. It is primarily based on demand forecast. Previously, this happens every hour by the hour. But just this year, the operation and the dispatch is now happening every five minutes. They ask what could be the demand five minutes later. Then which power plants based on the cheapest bids will be displaced, dispatched to operate? They should also make decisions to have additional generators that operate as reserves in case a couple of generators or even a transmission line become suddenly not operational or in case the forecast is off. These have to be contracted in advance. Of course, they also have to take into account startup of generators, which depending on the generation technology may need a few hours to start up. So basically, these are some basic concerns from our system operation. Before we end this discussion on T and D, let's pick up on what we have started on the electric vehicle in the first two weeks. We asked some questions on how this technology may affect the delivery of electric power. Let us start with a single household. Your family may be thinking of getting an EV. It could be a trike for a small business or you yourself is dreaming that your first car is an electric vehicle. We ask ourselves, do we have the facility to charge that EV? And uh, is the house wiring and the protection devices designed to accommodate it? We hardly have houses right now that are properly equipped with the outlet for the charging process, but that soon can change. There are common facilities for charging, such as the one we have at the EEI parking lot, care of Sir Luz work. But a few years into the future, we can easily imagine a community hosting dozens of houses with EV charging. How do you think will it affect the design of distribution network? Quite significantly, actually, because the demand has increased significantly, the utility may consider a higher voltage rating for their primary lines. The sizes and the capacity and the locations of the transformers will have to be reconsidered as well. Again, wires and protection devices will have to be resized. And you can easily extend that dreaming, not just to a single neighborhood, but across cities such as Mega Manila or Mega Cebu. So widespread adoption presents challenges in the redesign of TND networks. It starts with recognizing that we now have large individual loads from about 3 kilowatt to 300 kilowatts, which is the capacity of our chargers. Compare that to a typical house right now, even a large house with all appliances on, which it can only draw about 2 kilowatts of power at any one time. Then we multiply that on the adoption across an ever increasing area. That should require a huge total power demand and huge total energy demand. But there are opportunities here to replace fossil based car fuels, diesel or gasoline, with possibly more sustainable sources of electric energy. There is also an opportunity here to flatten the curve. Do you still remember our load curve? And we said that the ideal load factor is one. We can actually feel those values with EV charging. We call that valley feeling. So we can fully utilize our infrastructure. 
In order to do that, we need a smart power system which will detect when we have low demand and then intelligently get the part EVs to be charged during those periods. This can be done with A, proper computing to forecast the demand. B, we can have intelligent sensors to know the actual demand. C, we can have communication facility to transmit information to a central server. D, we can have another layer of computing to optimize the demand across a large area. And E, we again have the communication facility to dispatch individual EV, whether to charge or not. We acknowledge challenges that can make this work for the society's advantage. Next week, we hope to learn more and imagine more of these intelligent power systems that utilize computing and communication systems. So that's it for now.